Welcome to Lectionary Call-In for Tuesday, December 27th of 2022, where two laypersons, a pastor and an academician, gathers for about 45 minutes each week to discuss the Gospel Lectionary for the coming Sunday. This Sunday is January 1st, New Year's Day, 2023. And each Tuesday, we call in from wherever we may be at 6.30 a.m. Eastern Time. And for our friend Charles Willard in Minnesota, that's 5.30 a.m. Thank you, Charles. Our team is working to be faithful to year A, and that puts us in the Gospel of Matthew. We hope this discussion will provide areas of focus and reflection, and here's how we do it. We develop perspectives independently after the lead-off person shares some formative questions, and then in this virtual discussion room, we share, encourage, and challenge each other. And here are the folks joining us in today's discussion. Bill Hall from 47 Degrees, St. Petersburg, Florida. You're on mute, Charles. Charles Willard, 8 Degrees, Minnesota. (laughs) Um, Sarah Mickelson, uh, Tampa, Florida, where it's still 41. And I'm Don Upton in Charlotte, North Carolina. I don't know what the temperature is, but it is cold outside. Welcome, everybody. And our lead-off person for the week is uh, Sarah Mickelson. She's going to read the scripture and guide us through some very challenging questions. Hello, Sarah. Merry Christmas. Good morning. I didn't mean to be that difficult. Um, This morning, we're looking at Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 23, Um, the first half of verse 13 opens with, after they had left. And the they, in this case, are the three wise men um, who have visited, knelt, worshipped, and left for home a different way. Now, after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, And remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. When Joseph got up, he took the child and his mother by night and went to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated. And he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then this was fulfilled, what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentations, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because there are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph and said, Get up and take the child and his mother and go back to the land of Israel, for those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee, and there he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled, that he will be called a Nazarene. That ends the reading of our scripture. Um, So I have three questions. The first of the three is this. What does this passage tell us about Joseph? And every man, and how humanity responds to God's plan and promises. Question number two The Bible presents us with God's promises and an unwavering provision of bondage breaking salvation. What complements and contrasts do you hear between this passage and the passage about Moses? And what would you summarize the gospel narrative walk through the Advent year A? How would you summarize the gospel narrative walk through in Advent year A? What are the Advent gifts from these readings for you this year? 
Those are my three questions. And I guess I'll go back to the first one. What does this passage tell us about Joseph and every man and how humanity responds to God's plans and promises? What do you think, Bill? Uh, Sarah, of your your three questions, this was one where I think I put the most time and energy. Um, There's an ancient proverb some say a Zen proverb that says, the way I do anything is the way I do everything. Um, In other words, that to me means that we reveal our inner selves by our outward behaviors. Uh, Very akin to the letter of James in the New Testament. Um, And I say that because <laughs> I don't miss an opportunity to plug my brother James. Um, to me, Sarah, I expanded your question a little, though I will focus on Joseph, because there's a contrasting character, Herod, in this story. Okay? Um, Joseph, it seems very clear. I, I would describe him as a quiet man who had very clear principles. Uh, Joseph says very little in the gospel. And in the South, we would say Joseph was good folk. He's good people. One of those good-hearted, steady-eating kind of people. That's at least my impression, based admittedly on very little information in the New Testament. On the one hand, He wanted to adhere to his culture's requirements, which called for him to dismiss or divorce his fiancée who was pregnant before they were fully married. And yet he was able to listen to and hear and act on the messenger of God who called him to act counter to his culture. And also, Sarah, using recent terminology, Joseph had agency at every step of the way in his situation. I I take that use of agency today to mean I'm capable of making choices, uh, no matter what the circumstances. And therefore, for me, Sarah, there's a strength, a quiet strength in Joseph, a, a kind of... I I see him as a person able to reflect on his own circumstances and the other influences that are around him. There's no indication of coercion. And Joseph's inner principles and his outer realities were in tension and conflict repeatedly. And I'll come back to that in your third question. Yet, He managed the challenges in a way that was faithful to his inner self and in touch with the reality of the world in which he lived. In contrast, Herod is in this narrative and the rest of the New Testament narrative a painfully contemporary reminder of the lifestyles and behaviors of cruel narcissists who are in positions of leadership and whose focus is on retaining and building their power at the expense of other people's suffering and even death. Um, I would finish with saying that Joseph is the kind of person, as I perceive it, that I would like to have as a friend and as a, a mentor and an example of dealing with the tensions that our faith provides for us. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Charles, what are your thoughts? Uh, I don't really have many any thoughts to, of worth to contribute here. I, I do find that it's a puzzle that Joseph, in spite of this extraordinary display of strength and power and thoughtfulness and care and wisdom um, and support that Joseph provides, that he disappears from the scene. He's just gone. I mean, as though Matthew forgot that he had started out with Joseph 
and suddenly Joseph is nowhere to be heard from or seen. It's it's just a very strange. Um, and you know, if I were to say, well, why do, why would why would Matthew do that? I have I have nothing to say, so I'll stop. Don, what what do you think? If you're leading a discussion group or a class or something, which a lot of folks who listen to this do, uh, commend Sarah's question to you because it creates list making, and that's always great for for classrooms. So, uh, yeah, I came up with six things. One would be, and they're basic. There's just you know, there's simple things when it comes to Joseph, and it just blows up from there. One, he takes instruction. And two. He's aware of his own individual impact. It's not fruitless. He's aware of his own individual impact, despite the instruction from the creator, from an angel. Uh, number three, uh, there's no sense that I can get in this of guesswork or weighing the risk rewards or the timing of the departure or the evaluation of the circumstances. None of that is in there. Number four, and I think this goes to the everyman question. It is a tough passage. But there's nothing in it that's unusual or fantastic or extreme or rare. It's common. People flee. They have fled. They are fleeing now. Mortal danger. That is part of life in the human condition. I remember Nicole Parton Abner, who is uh, the pastor at Palmasia Presbyterian Church, the church that makes this podcast possible, five, five, six years ago when she preached on this, she said, this is a cold, hard scripture. But it doesn't make it unusual. There's nothing unusual in this, I'm sorry to say. People flee every day from mortal danger. Uh, and I think the fifth, the fifth thing is that Joseph does freestyle. We all get it. It looks like he's just following orders, but what's missing here in the little passages is that within the scope of the life of Christ, the raising of Christ and this family, within that he freestyles. It's kind of like somebody, you know, in employment. You know, the, the, great, the great work is, you know, I know the parameters of my job, but within that I have great innovation. And the innovation of a father is, is not written here, but we sure assume it, don't we? Within the frame of the life of Christ, we don't see what he's doing. Years past that he has a dream, they're going to go back. What's there? Isn't that like us and our parents? You know, I remember my dad was there, and he had something to say about it, period. <laughs> it could be a whole day or a week, and I just go, you know, I think my dad was there. It's just that unspoken thing. And the final note is um, there's – and I got this from Mark Davis, and I hadn't thought about it much. And Mark Davis, uh, some years ago when he did a translation, he emphasized the echo of Judas betraying and Joseph as the father embracing. And he says, you've got you to, gotta, you, you have permission to look at that together. And I thought that was very powerful. As for the everyman question, you put it in parentheses for the question mark, I think. That was like another question. And my answer is yes and no. Yes, but that's the sad answer because there's lots of every person, every pe every people, every man out there in history, and they're lost. Because people flee and they vanish from history. This is a tough passage. And he's here. So he's not an every man because the scripture pulls him to us. They show him to us. And those that carried their children and do today, and through uh, mortal danger, crossing borders, going to dangerous places, it's tough. They vanish. They vanish from history. He does not. So, yes, every man in that this is part of the condition that we live in, but no, he's called out as a singular man who does singular things in the frame of the life of Christ. That's what I'm thinking about. Perfect. Thank you. That helps me a lot. Um, so my notes are that he's unique in that he trusted what the angel said. He trusted, and to the point of obedience, 
Now, I often ask my children, why didn't you do what I asked you to do? And they said, because I thought I could do it better myself. (laughs) Not that we are defiant people, because we are. Um, In my house, I don't know about your house, but um, in my house we are a, a group of individuals who happen to coexist together and um and we have the difficult challenge of trusting each other's judgment trusting each other's decision making and i think that here we have an example of someone who was devoutly invested in trusting what he had been told um i don't know that i would have um done what Joseph did. You know, I'm, I'm looking back, my, 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 I don't know, are you sure that could be the right decision? We really need to run to Egypt. Are you sure? We need to become refugees. Are you sure that this, this is going to come to pass, this threat to the, the life of the child? But Joseph is committed to this. He's committed to the protection of his infant. He's committed to the protection of Mary. He has Without it, it, we aren't presented that he has doubts, but he follows through on what the angel asks of him. Um, so, for that, I, I don't know that he is an every person, but for the rest of the, the the passage, I think he's an opportunity for us to step into a place where we could be like Joseph. Um. Humanity does not generally trust. I, I I think that humanity generally only trusts when there's a quid pro, quid pro quo. Like, if you prove to me you're trustworthy by doing this, I'm going to do what you ask of me. So I'd see a tension between humanity and a creator when it comes to trust and obedience. And I think we're offered Joseph as an opportunity to see what's possible. Um, if, if we are, if we're in step, if we're, if we're trusting what God has asked of us. All right. The second question: The Bible presents us with God's promises and unwavering provision of bondage-breaking salvation. There's a lot of similarities here to the story of Moses. What compliments and contrasts do you see? With that story, Charles, do you have any thoughts? I have, I have no contribution. Okay, what do you think, Don? Uh, and, uh, and the story of Moses, it washes through everything because we can make comparisons of, of you know, it's just it, I mean, appropriated in many healthy ways across time. Uh, so I, uh, let, let me uh, respond by. Just reading one quote that I thought said it pretty well. Um, Shelley Matthews, who some years ago posted about this and working preacher, said, perhaps the good news of today's gospel lectionary is that Egypt has always been a part of the gospel story with Christ's child safely tied to the refuge he received in that country. In the surprising and disorienting ways that God's grace often operates, Safely and well-being, safety and well-being come into the holy family, not in a familial, familiar setting, but in an encounter with the other. The refuge is extended to them from the outside of conventional boundaries. And I think that says a lot about the experience of the gospel and the book of Matthew that we're encountering this year. So I, I wanted to, if we're going to talk about Egypt, then I think let's take it all the way and talk about the promise itself. And that means this is about memory and escape from mortal peril. And I think when we say memory, I'm I'm evoking memory within Matthew that we have to remember. And the idea of escape, I think, is tied to the human condition too, being delivered from mortal threats being delivered, de-delivered, 
sounds like the work of Christ, and it requires memory. And I think memory of fleeing, and this ties to Egypt, and I think it also is tied to other uh, exiles in Scripture. The memory of fleeing is failing. Who will chronicle? He's another book. Who will chronicle what has been lost in our memory? God gives that back. Memory is failing, especially because children are often involved and children don't remember being carried on the backs of their parents at all. They're just told the story. So I'm wondering, just like in Egypt, who tells the story? And I choose for fun and, uh, and for encouragement to believe that Jesus is taught the story of their fleeing as he grows up that he, does, he doesn't absorb it just because he's the Christ. It, he learns about what it is to be human because his parents tell him about when they fled. Otherwise, who's going to remember? And I think that's part of the poetry, is that the escape from danger, the mortal threats, where the act of fleeing itself is filled with peril, it sounds very close to what Christ is rescuing us from in the first place. And that it has to be Hold even to the Christ, because Christ has no memory of it. I think that's an interesting idea. And so I think back to the, the challenge of this passage, it only works if there's a strand of hopelessness in the human condition coloring the passage. That we know the name of Joseph because it's been given to us through the scripture, but the rest vanish from history. And there's this presence in the face of overwhelming fact that that's there. I was reminded of the memory uh, uh, matter because I, I was I was reading a guest blogger, I think it was in Poetry Magazine, Hai Dang Fan, uh, who's uh, exploring his refugee uh, experience from Vietnam, but when this person wrote about it, he said, uh, and I'm going to quote a little bit of it in snippets, the classroom crowded with adults and children all wearing headsets, a young woman sitting on the floor surrounded by boxes and luggage neatly stenciled in a dress in California. But I couldn't picture myself within those same frames. They stirred nothing distinct in my memory, though the scenes seemed vaguely familiar, like after images from elsewhere. In truth, I'm skipping ahead. I've been hoping to stumble across a lost memory, or at least hit upon a trove of secondhand ones. When these aimless searches turned up nothing, today I decided to click on to, and he speaks of a funding aid for collecting names and experiences and applications, and I entered into a boundless city of paper whose vast population clamored in silence. And I'm, I'm taken by that silence. So it goes back to Joseph. Every man or an individual, every, than every man, he would have been lost in history. And now I just invoke Jesus and the people going to the tomb to memorialize Jesus. What memory is being preserved here? And Joseph, Joseph is the, the champion here of the action of the doing within the instructions he has. And I, I believe Jesus being told this story, just like we're being told the story today, not lost in time. That's what I was thinking about, sir. Thank you, Don. Um, my notes on this, um, I can see these threads of common ground between the story of Moses and um, this birth narrative we have from Matthew. There's, there are people in bondage, a promised deliverer, the paranoia of power, the slaughter of innocence. My computer screens went black. Um, trust from a parent a trust surrogate, the blood of the lamb, judgment suspended, guilt passed over, a covenant established, deliverance from bondage. All of those things are, they have equal parts in the story of the life of Christ. And and I think that's really a sweet parallel that we can draw, um, that we can see over and over and over again how God makes a plan for us. Um, 
Eric Barreto in the WorkingPreacher.org um, commentary says, Matthew's claim then is that Jesus in some, spe- some significant sense embodies the people of Israel. He is the recipient, the bearer, and the fulfillment of the promises made to Israel by God. It's kind of a sweet thought. What do you think, Bill? Uh, Sarah, the way my brain works, I did a two-column same, different, your words complement, contrast, the old college question, compare and contrast, and my proclivity for both and. <laughs> um, briefly, my two columns. And to me, this is important. Both were males. Those separated by centuries, they each lived in a patriarchal society. Uh, and I think it's possible to infer that both were somewhat reluctant leaders. Moses particularly, he had murdered an Egyptian. He argued vehemently with God. Again, back to my characterization of Joseph as uh, one of those quiet yet strong people. Uh, I I sense a a reluctance. Um, And in terms of different. Moses remained prominent during and after his life on earth. He shows up in the New Testament uh, reference, uh, for example, the Transfiguration. And Charles has already noted that Joseph basically disappears after the event in the temple when Jesus was 12 years old. And even there, he's silent. Mary is the one who uh, confronts you talk about your children. <laughs> Mary was the typical mother. Jesus, what were you thinking? <laughs> um, so they're 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 different in the amount of coverage that they get in the Bible. But both, it seems to me, eventually acted out of accord with their inner desires and preferences. Moses wanted no part of going back to Egypt. Joseph uh, wanted no part of being linked to a woman who at least outwardly was violating the culture's ethics. Um, And yet each came to a point of obedience, which you emphasized earlier. And God uh, speaks to each one in unusual ways. For Moses, it was a burning bush. For Joseph, angels. Which goes back to, again, even though the communication was in an unexpected form. They were able to stand there and listen and reflect and choose to obey. And each was led by God into conflict with the political leaders of their day, Pharaoh and Herod. I reference that in my response to the first question. There are still Pharaohs and Herods in today's world. They are still doing their thing. And Egypt was a locale for a part of each man's journey. Interestingly, a difference for Moses, Egypt was a place of captivity, a cruel captivity. For Joseph, Egypt was a place of security and refuge. And one last thing, Again, emphasizing how prominent Moses is and how little attention is given to Joseph. Moses was the benefactor of a dramatic display of power, the parting of the Red Sea, the drowning of the Egyptian army. Joseph is one of these who just quietly slips away. My fantasy is under the cover of darkness, he and Mary and the baby go to Egypt, and he quietly re-enters later and goes uh, to Nazareth. By the way, to get into the weeds a little, the passage says that the prophets had foretold that Jesus would be a Nazarene. Nobody can find that prophet. (laughs) There are various ways to try to explain it, but it's not in our scriptures as we have them. 
So for me, again, Sarah, there's instruction in the similarities and differences of two men, in this case males, who struggled to listen to God and to find ways to be obedient even though it went against the grain. Thank you. Um, How would you summarize the gospel narrative walkthrough in Advent Year A? And what gifts of Advent, um, what, what gifts have been brought to you by these readings? Charles, do you have any? Nope. <laughs> Bill, what are your thoughts? Um, I noted at one point during the Advent when I was reading that it, it was a strange journey. We began with Matthew 24, then went to Matthew 3, then to chapter 11, then to chapter 1. In some ways, it was a reminder to me, Sarah, that even though that was a little dizzy, there was a message. The first week had to do with uh, alerting us that the return, the fulfillment of what Advent is beginning uh, it will be unexpected. We we can't know that time or place. And then the second week was John the Baptist preparing the way that even Jesus Christ, the divine human son of God, needed someone to prepare the way. And the third week was John's question, are you the one? I, I still resonate with that. Uh, it, it's, to use modern terminology, there's permission giving in that to question, to wonder, is is this really the one? Is this the way? And then um, the fourth week, uh, Matthew 1, Jer- jo- Joseph learns of Mary's pregnancy, which we already noted. Now, to Charles's questions about Joseph disappearing, here's what I wrote. You do not have to make the front page headlines to be a person of faith who acts congruently with your faith. I think there's a simplicity to the Joseph story that invites us, especially in our today's world. I am so tired of the news programs bannering breaking news, breaking news, breaking, like everything has got to be hyped up and dramatized. Sometimes it's in quiet ways that God is acting through people. And I will finish with a quote from Isaiah 55 that your your question took me to this, uh, Sarah, and to me this summarizes this Advent journey. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy on them and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. And here's the core for me. God is saying, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than your, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Bill. I, I also went back and reread our Advent messages that we've, uh, scriptures that we've walked through. Um, week one brought me at, uh, awake, engaged, and ready, in relationship, expecting. And in parentheses, I put hope, because I don't think you can be engaged, awake, and ready if it's not a hopeful perspective. Um, For week two, it's into the wilderness to find and be found. Um, What is calling to you? What might you be called away from? To what truth can you or I testify? And for some reason, I tried to align the Advent candles and the messages of those candles to these passages and I was looking for peace in those stories. Um, Advent 3, are you the one receiving the news? Who is loved by God? What do I see and hear? And that's testimony. 
Um, and it's a joyful testimony. Um, Advent 4, I, I thought about fear not, and Don Upton's favorite words, fear not through the eyes and ears and voice of Joseph, Emmanuel, God is with us. Um, I know Christmas A really is an Advent 5, but I kind of put it in that category. I said, who is the Christ, the beginning, the word, the light? Why God set creation in motion? So for me, that's really kind of a nice little stepping stone pathway to get us to where we're going to begin Epiphany. Um, I, Caroline Lewis did a blog for WorkingPreacher.org, and that God's promises to be God promises to be present in those in between times when wonder gives way to actuality, when simplicity fades into complexity, when joy seems to be overshadowed by that which or those who seek to steal the joy away. This particular passage is lead us into a protective anonymity, anonymity um, that the Holy Family can disappear into Egypt. I think there's this interesting um, cloak of invisibility to lift that from another story. Um, from the very first, the road Jesus walks is marked with both God's promises and human resistance. Jesus is both the living presence of God's promises and a constant irritant to those in power. That's from Eric Barreto in his blog on workingpreacher.org. Um, potential doom lean, looms over every one of these passages in Matthew, and Jesus' welcome into the world is not a unanimous acclamation, but fear that this child will subvert the order of the world and that a mere child could weaken the powerful. Um, I think that this is an interesting Advent walk that we have un- that we've walked through or that has unfolded for us, and I think we are now at that place where we see how quickly the the anticipated joy of Christmas Day is overtaken by the suddenly you're a refugee, you're on the road, you're trying to figure out how to make ends meet. Thank goodness the wise men brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh because those are the things they're going to need for the four years they're going to be in Egypt. So it's just this planful unfolding of God's provision um, and into the safety of, of a mass of faces. What do you think, Don? Well, I didn't read the article you were referencing about the in-between time, but I uh, I liked it because this has been a, a fresh, a different advent for me because it's it's filled with reminders that it's no in-between. There's, there's, it was filled with active thinking, act, doing things. And what the lectionary passages reminded me of is not to look away from the micro stories. Joseph is the micro of micro stories. Uh, And then within it, little pieces. Here's the story of Joseph. He went to bed. The angel came to him, told him to flee. He wakes up in the story. Uh, The angel comes to him and goes back. The angel comes to him and says, this Christ the Lord. Little teeny stories, not much there, but the power in that, the, the ability of us, for me, to look away on the micro stories, not just in scripture, but in life, is it's heavy. I can look away. I'm good at it. And this advent was filled with that. And I think I'm trying to make sense of in uh, in our tradition, I've I've sensed uh, an approach, maybe a teaching that. Uh, the looking away is almost trained up in us because, after all, we're talking about the creator. And it diminishes the human role. It diminishes. There's something about the theology that I've grown up in that works awfully hard to d- diminish the human role. So Jesus comes to save us. But there's this diminishment in it. 
Uh, and that's part of the looking away. These small things, after all, it's the creator. We're here to serve, but there you go. And this Advent, there's been such a connection to the names that the creator acts. The names are, are held up because they're individual. Every man may be, but also Martha, Joseph, Matthew, real people, and they're intimately involved, not in small things, but large things. And I think as we go through the book of Matthew this year, there's an insistence on pointing to things that appear to be trivial, raising them up, things that appear to be small, things that appear to be of no matter or a small matter in a universe with the Almighty. And Jesus says, no, no, we're not just in the world. We're not just going to be a part of the walk with Christ, but it, it matters. The action was like the frame that Joseph has given. He's, he's now to act as the father. He has he's a complex, rich life uh, with, uh, with the son. So I, I'm just feeling this activism in terms of raising up the names of people uh, to not look away from them, but to call out their names. And the reason I'm doing it, I'm hearing names called out. That today, all through the week, called out in prayer, called out in conversations, the people, the people, the people, and their stories always lifted up as being something gigantic. Our lives are big. <laughs> and there's an affirmation here, even in the face of uh, this terrible passage where they're fleeing and, you know, in a regular world, would have been wiped off the face of the earth, forgotten forever. Uh, and here that we have their names uh, as they flee. So that's, what I, that's the connection I'm, I'm making to the passages we have there. Wonderful. Any other questions or observations from this group? All set? Well, uh, everybody, we'll, we'll say uh, Merry Christmas to you a few days after Christmas. It's good to have you with us. Uh, Palmasia Presbyterian Church that makes this possible is at 3501 West San Jose Street. That's in Tampa, Florida. For more information, you can go to palmasia.org. That's P-A-L-M-A-C-E-I-A.org. If you'd like to communicate with us, email us at lectionarycallin at palmasia.org, lectionarycallin at palmasia.org. At the Palmasia website, we commend to you uh, readings of scripture, prayers, outstanding music, studies, reflections, differences of opinions, opportunities to take communion. So check that out. A final reminder for today, as we move into the new year, that we are shifting uh, to using the letters in lectionary through epiphany to examine mostly Matthew and briefly John. So we're going to look through those dimensions. So next week, Acts 10, and then we're going to make a pretty deep dive into 1 Corinthians. Uh, so if you want to prepare and think about that, it's a chance to, we've never done this before, but using the letters to approach the gospel. So we look forward to having you there, and you're always welcome, and we'll see you next time.